So I'm going to introduce Amy, who is an artist who uh, works in kind of digital media, print, photography and film, and is interested in kind of how we digitise things and this kind of, she calls it a push-pull between the digital and the in real life kind of landscapes and how art can speak into that and also how art is different digitally to how it is in real life. Um, so I am going to show us Amy's artworks, which she made in response to an audio recording from our previous artist, Sarah White. Um, and what I'd really invite you to do is to look at these artworks really, really carefully. It's really, really easy to kind of just flick through a screen or look at something really quickly. And I struggle to look at things for a long time on the screen. But I'm going to bring up the artworks by sharing my screen, but I'm going to try and leave them up there for a good few minutes so you have time to kind of examine them and engage with them. Um, and then we'll come back and Amy and I'll maybe have a chat about how the artworks are made. And we'll open that up for group discussion. So if you want to ask a question, just kind of go for it or put your hand up or type in the chat if you feel better about doing that. I can't. The chat has a bit of a delay on it, so I can't like respond straight away. So speech is encouraged, but also chat is okay as well. So I'm just gonna share my screen and please nod if you can all see it and then I'll know that it's worked. So hopefully also three images of two different prints. Um, Amy, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so I guess there's already a lot of compliments coming in through the chat of your beautiful work. And thank you for kind of responding so promptly and so 
beautifully. The works are really, really delicate. And I know that maybe their delicacy and their kind of intimacy doesn't suggest, well, not doesn't suggest, but um, I find it quite interesting that you went through quite a long process to result in these really, really delicate prints. Yeah, do you like to kind of talk more about that? And... Yeah, for sure. Um, I suppose the delicate nature of them in the end doesn't really reflect the whole process. Um, but I think like the process starts off as a series of photographs and then uh, in a lot of my work, I use digital media. Um, in this case, it was photogrammetry, um, which just meant using a process that museums use a lot in order to archive their work, which isn't always seen by um, visitors, but you can often access archives and collections online uh, with photogrammetry. And so I use that to sort of digitalize moments or objects which aren't deemed with much importance. So the two prints that you see is one of a flower that I picked in spring and one of a wild garlic leaf, which I uh, picked recently sort of digitizing these small moments of intervention within a larger landscape mm -hmm. and sort of recording and archiving my own life, but also moments within nature. And then uh, that process goes on to rendering the object and putting it into various 3D systems to sort of bring it to life and bring it into a physical object. And then um, it's printed off and transfer printed to sort of get this fragility of um, I suppose time in a, a sort of a non-linear way, sort mm. of moving and fleeting. Yeah, it's interesting that you've you picked a technique which is used during uh, museum archiving because part of this project was actually inspired by um, I listened to a podcast. I don't know, maybe it was over Christmas or something, where um, they were talking about the British Museum and how it had been affected by lockdown. And essentially what they noticed happen is during lockdown, a lot of the objects started to crumble and they couldn't work out why this was for a long time until they realized that they were lacking 18,000 daily visitors to the British Museum. And the lack of their breath had actually changed the humidity. So the objects had started to crumble because there was no people. And I think archives only exist to serve people and to remember things and to hang on to memories. So I find it really interesting you'd be used the technique that museums use to kind of explore that further. But then in using that archive technique, you've produced an artwork in its own right. It's, it's a record, but it's not, it's not a record that's written. It's a record that kind of looks very delicate. Um, yeah, no, um, I think, well, a lot of the other artists touched on archiving in museums as well, which we had discussed prior to this, sort of how we thought this was going to pan out. But um, I think, I suppose I wanted to use the technique um, conceptually, just because I think museums get to pick what is important. Um, they very much get to decide what we look at. And as you said, well, what's the point in archives if people aren't accessing them and using them? And um, I suppose by using this process in that way, I get to decide what I want to look at and what I want to preserve. Um, yeah. But also, I suppose I take issue with museums sometimes exhibiting work or showing work rather than necessarily housing it. I think there's a strong difference between this act of care to house an object with this very specific act of exhibiting. And I think maybe some time and consideration could be taken to look into the context of these objects and really housing and caring for them. And I think this act of digitalization through photogrammetry, I kind of see almost as an act of care, a care for moments that I want to preserve and sort of bringing in slightly different narratives and everyday narratives, working class narratives into a similar context. 
Yeah, I find that interesting that you've kind of had this act of care of digitizing something, but then you've ensured that it's become a physical object. Mm. And we were talking earlier about how a lot of photographs we took, we take won't ever become physical objects. They'll just kind of sit there in the ether and they never become a physical thing. And I find that interesting that as humans, we take photographs and we want to record something, but then we, we don't want to care for that recording in the same way. And I think that's there's something pertinent in that, which is in your prints. Yeah, I think by making it into a physical object, it's sort of like a, a further act of care, but also a way of trying to understand the fragility of moments and objects. I think if you leave it in a pristine condition and I did experiment a little bit with um, 3D printing these renderings. Um, I think if you leave it almost within the digital realm, it doesn't speak to that fragility or to the nature of those objects crumbling. And I think it's really important to understand that we can care for these objects, but they will age and actually there's something really nice about them aging because I think if you take an object from the past and bring it into the present, it sort of continues its history in a non-linear way. And it, yeah. can continue to, it can continue to live within the context of now. And I suppose that's kind of what I was trying to do. Yeah, I think there's a lot of like circular kind of, mm. circular kind of processes with your work in that you've taken something physical, you've digitized it, and then printed it physically. But then in this process, we're enjoying it digitally. So it's kind of come full circle. It's, it's very, very strange in a lot of ways. But I'm also thinking about what you're saying about kind of keeping objects and um, archiving them as physical objects, which, you know, you can do in an order amount of time until those objects are physically break down. Whereas I'm wondering, with keeping something digital how is that going to pan out in the future because our digital systems i'm assuming are going to change you know in order to play, play a gramophone record you have to have a gramophone mm. and how how are those systems going to change and are we actually going to be able to enjoy these digital artworks like you know 200 years in the future and i, I think i find that interesting because you can't if you have a physical object, it's still a physical object. Whereas if you have a file, you need a machine to read that file. And if you don't have that machine, then that file is lost. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really interesting that you say that. Um, I kind of I kind of see it as the same, right? So if you have a physical object which is deteriorating, you're putting in steps and acts of care within caring for that object. And I think it's very similar when it comes to digital, like rendering or making the file accessible on digital ways it's just sort of shifting in the different ways we are preserving and caring for it yeah I think within my work as we discussed I like to explore the sort of push and pull and having a tension between the landscapes which we're living in which very much now is one very digitally and then one in the physical and exploring those acts of removal and documentation and archivization within those two realms and having a push and a pull between what it's going to look like and how it's going to feel to a viewer because I don't think it has to be perfect and I think there's a lot of pressure sometimes around work being a finished piece and perfect and polished um, much like objects when you archive them or look at them historically you want to keep them in this perfect condition I don't think that always necessarily needs to be the case like imperfections can be really lovely within work and often I think personally allowing for the media that I choose to be seen within the work if it's if it's grainy or there's slight mistakes mm. like if you accidentally say if you were developing like film photography and there was watermarks on that I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing I think it's a mark of authorship or a mark of time and yeah that's really interesting as well yeah I think having objects which have that journey is is really interesting there's an artist who whose names obviously escapes me now at this important moment but um they took some really uh 
some film photographs of my dad and um they because the films were so important they had them in their hand luggage and they obviously at the airport they had to put them through the security scanner and only when they developed the photograph did they realize that the x-ray machine had like put bands across their photographs but actually they decided it didn't matter because what had happened is they'd not only recorded photographs of my dad but they'd recorded the traveling so they've recorded the process of moving from one place to another and I think that's really interesting because I think sometimes we do really strive for artworks to be perfect and actually there's probably no such thing I think artworks can record experience or record something but experience isn't perfect people aren't perfect I think yeah so I find it interesting you say that and I think yeah it's a mature kind of response to that um I'm aware the chat's been going um does anyone kind of have any initial responses to Amy's work or... Just remove the spotlight. So if you want to go back to gallery view, go to the top right corner and then you can see everyone. Yeah. So if you want to, you can just go for it by unmuting yourself or raise your hand. Kind of helps me order things. Uh, Martha and Eliza. Hi, Amy. Um, it's lovely to yeah, see us down. Um, yeah, it just, it really reminds me um, of a talk I went to recently about kind of ethics of private collecting um, and this obsession with having like real genuine artifacts as opposed to replicas, um, you know, reproductions. Um, I just thought it was really interesting because obviously like artifacts do decay and, and crumble over sort of longer time scales, but then you've chosen something like a flower or a leaf that sort of decays, you know, maybe over a matter of days and you've already taken that step in sort of realizing that there's a lot of value in in the reproduction and in that process um and i guess that's kind of reflective of like this whole project of things being passed along and value being added at every step rather than it being taken away um and uh, yeah i guess just what what you think that concept as a whole could add to like museums or galleries is like more focusing on the value of, of reproduction mm. yeah I think, I suppose in, in this situation, using it to make artwork with, is sort of speeding up that process of reproduction and yeah, housing objects, I guess I would say. Um, I think when we speak about the ethics of museum and galleries and protecting these stuff and reproducing, it, it's a really interesting question and by no means do I have any definite, def like definite answers. Um, I think reproductions are important and more importantly to me are accessible. I, I think, especially right now, it's, it's really hard to access these sites and these histories, right? And by at least digitizing in a reproduction, so creating spaces where they're interactive and you can look at these, it makes it accessible. And I think if there's one thing that reproductions can do is open a platform to people in different countries or in different spaces or with disabilities that would find it hard to get into those spaces and I think it's a really important conversation sort of at least discussing the ethics of reproduction of artifacts in that way yeah thank you does anyone get any other questions you can put in the chat if you want to remain invisible um yeah, Lydia made a good point about we did indeed go to MIMA a few years ago and they actually had a kind of community curation, a whole gallery dedicated to it, where they got members of the community to pick something out of the archives and display it on permanent display at MIMA. And it was really interesting what people picked and why. And I think, um, yeah, it was just a really, really lovely exhibition because you felt like you were really looking at things that were collectively important to people, not just important to like the three curators who happened to go to the archive that day. Mm -hmm. um, 
No, I think that's really important. And I think that's that's so lovely that they chose to curate in that way. I think museums as a whole should probably ask people a little bit more what they want to see. Um, and I think community curating in that way can be really interesting. And I'll have a look at that like after this talk. And <laughs> Yeah, it is really good. I think at SOAR, we do really try and curate in a community way and we spend a lot of time kind of listening to locals on, on what they want to see in the gallery and what issues are really pertinent to them so we've done a number of um, issues on kind of housing and the housing crisis um, particularly in Shieldfield we've got an exhibition coming up in September on that very issue um, but there are also you know being as a curator being honest there are also a lot of kind of other decisions that come into that kind of aesthetic decisions and curatorial decisions which you kind of have to narrow down and are really hard and you have as a gallery you have very limited resources um so yeah i find community curation is really really interesting but definitely not without its challenges um, and of course, having the collection and holding an archive collection is full of its own challenges as well, I'm sure. So obviously doesn't have an archived collection and we don't have loads of artworks in the store cupboard. Like we just don't have the facilities for that. But I find it interesting to see how arts organisations kind of deal with that. No, definitely. I think... Obviously, it all comes with its own challenges, but as long as you're conscientious and think about these things, I think you're doing far more than most. So it's, it's really nice to look at it in that way. Um, if anyone's ever read Grayson Perry's Playing to Gallery, he has this great section on how artists are rediscovered. And um, he talks about artists kind of work lying in archives for years and years and years and growing dusty until young upstart curators come and decide this person needs to be rediscovered and has a retrospective exhibition and I would recommend it it's a really really funny and kind of humorous read but also an insight into how well curators are viewed and I'm sure there are a few artists who have been rediscovered in that way but also it's quite sad because they're often not rediscovered until they've died so it's kind of quite it can be quite bittersweet I guess um yeah does anyone else oh Lydia has a question I'm interested in um in how you became how you became interested in the whole archive process and if you've tried other processes than what you have created um for this exhibition mm, yeah I, I suppose I've been interested in archiving for a while, but also archaeology. And to be honest, like Martha's on this call, um, it, she's an archaeology student, and it's really interesting to have conversations with other people that look into these areas, but in different ways. And by no means am I an expert, but I, I like to try and understand the archive and having art history lectures on the archive and the way that we document things is is really nice. Um, I've tried other processes sort of working with 3D printing and also documenting with film photography and sort of exploring the transient nature of that as well. Um, yeah, I've explored around and I suppose it's always an ongoing process to sort of look into documentation and what I want to document. Um, I think often I use the act of documentation and the archive in processes that I would go through anyway. Um, so whether that be performance or um, exploring it with sculpture, sort of documenting as I go along and then developing the role of film and deciding then what I want. And I suppose giving up authorship a bit to other people that I involve in my practices to decide that as well. It's um, very rarely do I not work with people like if it's in my studio or with friends and I don't take full control over that I think sort of just the act of documenting is quite interesting for me not necessarily going out of my way to create these things to archive I guess yeah I like that because I feel like we are all 
archivists, is that the right term, in the way that we take photos and keep things or scrapbook, but not many people really think about what that means or why why often we're, we're taking a photo or we're documenting something. So I think it's a great great thing to actually think deeper about and what why we're doing that and the purpose of it. Definitely. I think also having conversations with other people like my friends that have collecting practices is also really interesting in another way like I choose to do it through digital mediums or um, like photography but a lot of my friends collect and actively house these objects within spaces whether that be like centering around the kitchen or um, like one of my friends collects tennis balls like collecting these things that seem quite mundane to a lot of people but retelling stories and I think that's really interesting in itself as well. I was wondering how you found the um, the process of like receiving a recording and stuff. Uh, it's a slightly self-motivated question. <laughs> I'm going to do, do it at some point. But um, yeah, and also like recording, like how you thought about like that process of moving it on to someone else and stuff like that. Um, you know, what? I was really nervous to start with because I was like, oh, like, what are they going to say? Like, will it fit with I ideas or my practice as a whole? I suppose like the reason I wanted to be a part of this project was because it kind of fitted in really nicely with my practice and so that eased a lot of worries anyway and I've responded from like audio and text before so it wasn't too bad and I think you have enough time and it's a really nice process just to start thinking. I suppose I kind of personally fitted it in with my studio work that I was working on anyway. So the process wasn't that that hard for me to get going. Um, I don't know, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I didn't find it too bad, I guess. Yeah, no, sounds fun. Um, well, has, did the thing that you sent off feel quite different from the thing that you received? Um, I don't think the tech, the audio felt different. I think the audio felt very similar, like we touched on similar points of uh, memory and sort of the movement of objects and she spoke about the digital quite a bit but then seeing the piece last week um, from Sarah our pieces are really different so I think the audio didn't feel different but the way we ended up interpreting and working with like styles and mediums was so that was just exciting to see how similar stuff can be and yet turn out so different. We've got a question from uh, Gia, who has kind of sent quite a long comment, but it ends in, I've always liked how, in my opinion, how your work makes it insignificant and makes it significant. Is that intentional? Um, uh, thanks, Gia. Um, I mean, I would say I don't know whether I feel the subject matter is completely insignificant, but sort of marks and authorship over the work that come along with working with different mediums, whether that be print or photography in the comment that G has put. Um, I don't intend to make them massively significant. I just kind of think they hold a timestamp and how mm. these objects move on or these works move on. And I think that's really important to try and as I've, as I've said, get away from perfectionist tendencies and sort of hold with the work moments, I suppose, of reanimation. So like if you take work from a long time ago or you take film from a long time ago and then reprint that years later, you're sort of combining these two moments, right? And I suppose that's what I find significant is working in a way that's not linear. It's sort of spreading out lengthways and pulling moments together and materials together to kind of create a bigger picture of time. So that's what I find significant for me. But um, I know in Gia's own work, she um, documents the mundane and it is something that I really enjoy uh, in her practice to sort of look at everyday life. And I suppose that's where our practices overlap and I enjoy that, so.
Has anyone got any more questions? I'm going to assume someone's furiously typing somewhere. Um, I think in our previous conversation, we talked a lot about memory and how you wanted to kind of uh, use this beautiful phrase, um, which was create a resting place for moments, which I really loved. I mean, I think it struck me that your prints do actually look like resting places because the leaves just rest on the texture of the paper and they're almost kind of imprinted. Yeah. Um, and it also struck me how, well, just how the texture is different. I know that paper has a texture, but I can't really engage with it in the same way on a screen. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I use the phrase resting place to not isolate these objects from the time that I'm taking these photos. So sort of, I decided to use the wintergreen transfer print because I was thinking about doing photo etching, but often I'm really bad at cleaning the plates and filing them down and I often get a border. Mm. And I, I didn't want that for this. I didn't want to fit them into that time place that I'm printing, rather create a frame around the object from what it's sitting on. Yeah. I wanted to create a resting place for these memories within that time I was documenting it and then change it again by printing it later um, and going through these processes of different time periods and this push and this pull. Yeah, sort of, I suppose I wanted to create a resting place from Sarah's audio she spoke about she was moving house and um, she spoke about finding a resting place for herself and the objects eventually. And um, I suppose I took that quite literally and wanted to bury them within a surface. And I think texturally it turned out really well. I think mm. seeing that texture, because obviously that's not the texture of the surface I was working on that sort of happened through the 3D rendering. Right. Or resting this very physical object within the digital and then vice versa sort of having this push and pull. Great I think there's another question in the chat. Process wise how do you think your sculptural stuff and more 2D work will interact or will they at all? So I'm guessing maybe you want to talk a little explain a little what your sculptural work is for those who haven't seen it. Well I can, I, I work in sculpture from time to time I think I've worked quite 2D this term um, in print and digital print which um, I mean Sajal is aware I'm, I'm not quite happy with personally, um, I would have preferred to work more sculpturally this term but I time-wise and everything it's, it's just mm. happened but I really enjoy seeing my prints interact with sculpture and sort of I use metal quite a bit to create sculptures that can interact. Um, I, I suppose it's hard to explain, like um, in other work I've used um, wooden pallets to sort of create landscape and then inputting print onto that. Mm. I suppose it's more about texture for me and framing it within the right context. Yeah, I suppose I'm still trying to figure that out, but I think for me, um, this work will probably evolve past this project and eventually sit in situ with sculpture, sort of combining different moments and different thoughts. Great. Um, so I think the time has kind of come for us to hear the audio which you responded to, um, because I think that's always interesting to kind of know how you responded to something. And we purposefully play this at the end because I think we want people's initial responses to the visual, but then it is really interesting to know where the artist has come from. So I think we're just gonna, we'll play that now and then maybe we'll come back with just some kind of last minute questions and responses. Um, and then we'll probably wrap up before one. Yeah. So if we could play the audio now, that'd be brilliant. Hi, it's 5.30 a.m. and I'm writing this on my phone. It's Monday and I'm moving house today. 
shifting objects and myself from one part of town to another, gathering them together from the corners of my life, still trying to find a resting place for them and myself. The artist before me spoke of memories carried on the wind. She mentioned rain falling through the trees, of the texture of stones, and I remembered a day a few weeks ago when I sat under a tree in the rain as everyone in the park cowered under temporary shelters which barely covered us. Strangers huddled together. Can I share your tree? The men asked. I had gone to the park to think, traveling to another part of the city to get some perspective. I'm drawing, or I'm trying to draw this memory, stitching it into canvas and fabric. I'm wondering from what perspective compositionally one draws a memory but I'm distracted by all the moving and my attention is being drawn to other objects, to old furniture, inherited antique dinner sets, glass jars and labels, to matching color palettes, pink, lilac, green, turquoise, black, mustard, yellow, clay, blue, gray, off white. I think I will make something small, a cross stitched image, a bit like pixels on a computer screen. The artist before me sounded so calm and joyful in her making. I'm still unsure how to find that freedom and play she talked about. I wish I could recreate for you the same piece I heard in her voice note. But still, I hope there is something here which stimulates your imagination. I think that's it's a very beautiful voice note. I think throughout this project, I've been just overjoyed by how, not over, but really surprised by how kind of almost intimately these artists talk to each other in that they're leaving these little tiny messages um, and they're speaking from artist to artist, which I think is really interesting. And they always carry something of their mood and how they're making and how they're feeling creative within those notes. And I think that filters through to the next art, the visual artwork. Um, yeah. Does anyone else have any kind of responses to Sarah's artwork? I find it interesting she mentioned pixel, pixels and digitization, which was apt. I I thought that there was something, it's not like a question, I don't know, there was just something really nice about um, the kind of like closeness of her voice to the microphone, I think, and the way that you responded to the, your, your prints kind of seemed to respond to that in the like, it felt as, like I was reading those prints as like, um, something like pressed onto glass and sort of flattened up against it. And there was like, I don't know, like your the the texture of the prints felt really, um, I don't know, like really close in the same way that her voice did to the microphone. And yeah, I don't know, I just appreciated that. It was, it was cool. <laughs> Thank you. No, I'm really glad it felt that way because I suppose it's printing in that way. I kind of want to create an intimacy and obviously I wanted to do Sarah's audio justice as much as I can because it was it was so beautiful getting that voice note in such an intimate and personal way. So, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, this project has been kind of surprisingly intimate and personal, especially between the artists and I think like the relationships they formed in a way, even though it's kind of in this disjointed audio and visual way. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for kind of coming along and asking questions and engaging with this work. It's been really lovely. Um, if you are a Newcastle student and would like to more, know more about SOAR, please feel free to kind of email us. We have volunteering opportunities or opportunities to exhibit with us often. And we're also interested in, we have a project coming up in the next few months where we're going to be working with 
students particularly who live in Shieldfield. So if you have ever lived or live in Shieldfield, particularly in student accommodation, we would really love to hear from you. Um, we're doing a kind of community exhibition program of events, kind of potentially September to November. So if that is you, we'd really, really love to hear from you. And I'll be sending some kind of call outs out in the next few weeks about that. Um, so thank you all for coming next week, exactly the same time and with exactly the same Zoom link, we'll be talking to the next artist, Ken, about her work. And um, Ken is like a kind of community collaborator. She loves bringing people together. She loves questioning things. She loves gardening. She loves photography. She's a woman of many, many talents. Um, so please come along and just chat with her. We have no idea what her artwork is currently. We'll only find out on Monday. So if you'd like to see some more kind of exciting art revealed, please join us again on Wednesday lunchtime. Um, it'd be lovely to see you. But I'd really like to thank Amy for kind of being brave enough to talk to a big group of people over Zoom um, about her artwork, which I know can be quite a pressurised thing, but hopefully we haven't made it too pressurised. So thank you for everyone coming and Lydia for doing the tech and everything. Um, and hopefully I'll see you next week. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you.